All right, the, chap the title of chapter 32 is The Great Depression and the New Deal. I'm going to start out this chapter by showing you some pictures of what life was like in the uh, 1930s, early 30s to mid 30s during the Great Depression. You had people living in lean-tos like this. You had, you know, people just, uh, just dirt poor. Um, this woman has a potato sack that she's wearing as a dress. And you could see your sweater, tough situation. This is a, a, a photo taken by a, a well-known photographer by the name of Dorothy Lang, and it's titled The Migrant Mother, a young mother. She doesn't look young. She looks weathered because of her circumstances, but she's in her 20s. Here's another picture of the migrant mother and her family, a Dorothy Lang photo living in a tent. That's, a, that's a, another example of a lean-to in the background there. The irony of this uh, sign is just glaring. World's highest standard of living, there's no way like the American way. And just below that sign, you have people standing in bread lines waiting for food. Lines were very common, as you could see down here and up here in this picture, whether it's, you know, you're in line to... Uh, apply for a job in line at a soup kitchen in line to get government uh, food food stamps things like that all right so the election of 1932 comes along and it's really uh, anyone but hoover herbert hoover is going to run for the republican party uh, it says here he was nominated without much vigor and true enthusiasm because people weren't fired up about what was happening. Uh, he is at times unfairly blamed for the Great Depression. The Great Depression was coming no matter what. A lot of people are, are blaming the Republicans, the combination of Harding, then Coolidge, then Hoover with their uh, economic policies. Fact of the matter is the Great Depression is worldwide. There's a lot of things that were helped that were caught helped to cause that in the last chapter we looked at many of them he's being opposed by democrat franklin delano roosevelt remember i i told him i told you about him in the last chapter he was a vice presidential candidate under cox who lost the election of 1928. he uh was the co he was a cousin of theodore roosevelt he was the former assistant secretary in Na of navy um, he's very, had a very similar path to the presidency as his cousin. The difference is they're from different political parties. Theodore Roosevelt wasn't very happy about his cousin, uh, FDR, becoming a Democrat, but uh, he accepted it. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was married to the niece of TR. So, yes, they were related. They were cousins. FDR was suave, kind of cool and conciliatory, meaning he was a politician and he negotiated and compromised with people. Uh, TR, on the other hand, was more confrontational. It's a little bit different there. In 1921, uh, FDR was stricken with polio, um, was it, which is a terrible disease of the nerves back then that took away his ability to walk. He was paralyzed from the waist down. Early on, he was paralyzed higher, but then regained some of his movement uh, in the upper body. But from the waist down, he was paralyzed and was never able to feel his legs ever again after 1921. Uh, he was bound to a wheelchair, but through hard work and determination, he was able to um, get himself to walk with crutches. And I'll talk about a little bit about that, a little more about that in a while. Uh, you could see here how what a massive, massive victory it was for FDR. Um, so it, he, you know, for the electoral vote count, 472 to 59. Noteworthy here was the transition of African Americans from the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, to the Democrat Party, to the party of Roosevelt, who they thought would be someone who could definitely help them out. Um, Roosevelt. His famous uh, line that he delivered in his inauguration speech, the only ha thing we have to fear is fear itself, pretty much sums up his presidency. Not everything that FDR did or tried worked, 
But if it didn't, he would acknowledge it and go back to the drawing board and come up with something else. He would try. And then if that didn't work, he would try again. Um, yeah, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself is, was, was a, a profound thing to say uh, during this time that Americans were so deep in the Great Depression. So here is one of the few pictures that we have of FDR in a wheelchair. Uh, you know, the, he, he believed that it was we, a weakness. Um, you know, it's, it's sad to think that he felt that being in a wheelchair or being handicapped was a weakness, but that's how he felt. He never wanted anybody to picture him in a wheelchair. And this is one of the few that we do have uh, with him in a wheelchair. Um, he would oftentimes travel to Warm Springs, Georgia where he would um, bathe himself in the uh, natural springs uh, that supposedly give relief to people who were stricken with polio, these natural hot springs and all their minerals in there supposedly helped. Uh, he enjoyed it so much that he bought a home there and he built a hospital. He paid for and had built a hospital for people who were stricken with polio, where he, he built a huge pool that's in the background here that was... Uh, the water was came from the natural springs around that area. So people who had polio would go to that hospital and, and, and he would oftentimes go there and visit with patients and swim with them. The FDR Memorial in Washington, DC is one of the newest of the memorials, very controversial at the time that uh, it was, it was open in like, you know, probably late nineties, 1997, 1998, somewhere around there. Um, there, there's a big controversy of how to depict Roosevelt at the very end of your experience of walking through the FDR Memorial. It's, it's different than say the Washington Memorial or the Lincoln Memorial or the Jefferson Memorial that are massive and huge and tall. The FDR Memorial is more sprawling. You walk through it many acres, but the, the controversy was how to depict him at the end, whether to put him in a wheelchair or not. Um, handicap rights advocates were saying you need to put him in a wheelchair because he's an inspiration to those with with handicaps who have handicaps and then uh, historians say well he didn't want anybody to uh, picture have any pictures of him or see him in a wheelchair and also he he really said you know uh, I never want he never really wanted to have a memorial dedicated to him bigger than his desk that was a quote from FDR. So not only if you depict him in a wheelchair, are you going against his wishes, but you're also going against his wishes by even building the memorial. So anyways, they compromised and they have a small statue within the uh, memorial of him in a wheelchair. And there it is right there. At the very end, like the very last thing you do as you walk through this monument is you see his statue that's right here. It's big, it's pretty big, not Lincoln big or, or Jefferson big, but it's big. I'll show you a picture that gives you some perspective. But you could see that he is in a chair. It doesn't appear to be a wheelchair, but it is. If you go around and you go to the back of this, you'll, there's a chair that's sticking out, very symbolic of him. The cape hides the wheels, but the wheel does come out here in the back. If you turn, if you saw the brown in the back, you could see it. And here's chieftains. Here's our uh, back in the '90s. This is the year that it opened. So you could see some of my students here um, that are there, and you could get a perspective of how big that is, or how small it is, depending on, on you know if you compare it to like the Lincoln Memorial or the Jefferson Memorial. If you look very closely, you'll see. Mr. Naroyan right there. There's Mr. Naroyan. He's in seventh grade at this time. FDR had a plan coming in. He had to. Things were so bad. He wanted to attack the he wanted to attack the depression and use the by, by way of the three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. Relief was immediate. You have so many people that are out of work, that are homeless, that are hungry. They need a re relief right now. That would be something that Hoover wouldn't have done with his uh, rugged individualism stance 
Um, he would not have been willing to uh, give handouts to anyone. But uh, Roosevelt's more like from the school of desperate times lead to desperate measures. So sometimes you got to give people handouts. Recovery would be long term. If you just give somebody a check or whatever, that's just going to be temporary, like relief would be. Recovery would be long term. How do you get how do you create jobs so that that check comes every week? You get in a paycheck. Any kind of job creation was recovery. Reform was changing the system so that we're never in this catastrophic state again as a country. How do you reform the system? Because something went wrong to get us to that point. How do you make sure it doesn't ever happen again? So the combination of these three, relief, recovery, and reform, definitely um, you know, was a plan of FDR and would be a great essay down the road about relief, recovery, and reform, of course. Okay, so let's talk about, this is a great example of relief. The biggest problem coming in for Roosevelt as he saw it was banks closing. And you know that Hoover with his reconstruction finance corporations tried to help banks by giving them loans and people complained saying you're giving loans to banks but you're not giving food to people. Um, but he knew that banks closing was, was catastrophic. So think about it this way. If you had your life savings in the bank You've been working all your life and you plan to retire and you have your life savings there. And then that bank closes and all the money in it is gone and you lose your life savings. That's horrible, right? That doesn't happen now because of the reform that happened from this time. But back during this time, that could happen. And it did happen. Banks were closing. People were losing all of their life savings. So Roosevelt, out of desperation, declares within hours of becoming president, a bank holiday. He shut down every single bank in the United States and said, these banks will not reopen until the United States government has looked into their reserves to see if they have enough money to continue. He's trying to get people to chill out. And the reason he's trying to get people to chill out is because of this, a run on a bank in Detroit, a run on a bank. This was going on everywhere. People were rushing to the bank to get their money out because they thought the bank was going to close. People run, run, running to the bank to take their money out is, is going to lead to banks closing. So he somehow had to stop these runs on banks. So he shut every bank in the United States. There's a, there's a run on a bank in Connecticut right here. You could see these people, they're, they're desperate. They want their money because they're afraid that bank is going to close and all the money in it's going to be gone and they're going to lose their life savings. You can imagine the fights that would occur out there and the des desperation. During his first 100 days, Roosevelt passed a lot of legislation. Um, every time a president is in office and he's in there for the 100 day mark comes up, they say, what did he do in the first 100 days? It's unfair. They compare everybody to Roosevelt because he's known for his first 100 days and the amount of legislation that he signed into law. He demanded that Congress pass laws and then he would sign it and it would become law and he had a green light to do whatever he wanted basically. The Supreme Court said, we're not gonna deem any laws, any of these laws initially unconstitutional because we're in such a terrible state as a country. So things like the Glass-Steagall Act that we'll be talking about, all these AAA, NRA, PWA, CCC, FERA, TVA, they begin to call all of his organizations or his laws, the alphabet soup organizations because there's so many AAA, NRA, so many letters in there. Let's talk about the Banks Steagall, bank, the Glass-Steagall Banking Reform Act that combined with the bank holiday um, really helped uh, calm people's fears when it came to the closing of banks. The Glass-Steagall Banking Reform Act created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. If you go to a bank today, you'll probably see a plaque that says member of the FDIC. Um, and that means that their money in that bank is insured. And that if you put your money in that bank and the bank burns down or the bank is robbed or there's a run on bank and it has to close, you are guaranteed by the United States government to get your money back. Your money is insured. You sleep well at night knowing that the money that you put in the bank isn't going anywhere. It is you're going to get it no matter what because of the FDIC. 
So the combination of the closing of the banks plus the Glass-Steagall Banking Reform Act and the creation of the FDIC uh, made things better in the world of banks. FDR also managed the currency knowing that inflation was something that needed to be achieved, but it was it had to be controlled inflation. So he uh, told people to turn in their gold and he gave them uh, turn, turn in their gold and he gave them an inflated amount for that gold. So if it was worth a hundred dollars an ounce, he paid them two hundred dollars an ounce just to try to get more money out there in circulation and build up the gold deposits. The CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, um, probably one of the biggest uh, job creators uh, during the Great Depression was the CCC. It put three million uniformed young men between the ages of 18 to 24 uh, to work. And they worked mostly in national parks like Yosemite and Glacier National Park, um, Yellowstone. They reforested areas that needed to be reforested, meaning they planted trees. They became firefighters. They drained swamps. They controlled floods. They built trails that you could use to go hiking. Each man was paid 30 bucks a month, 25 of it was sent home to their families, whether that be their wife, if they're married or their parents, if they're not. The reason they didn't give them all their money is because they're in Yosemite, they're in Yellowstone. There's no way to spend it. The government wants to stimulate the economy with this money and also help pay for food for families. These men are getting pay, paid and they're also getting food from the government. So they're, they're, it's like very militaristic. They are fed and they are paid. So they don't need the money there in Yellowstone. The family needs it wherever that home is. So they would send 25 of it home and uh, five of it would go in their pocket. So the CCC, picture of CCC recruits in Camp Roosevelt in Virginia. Here's some other pictures of CCC at Glacier National Park here, a group in Des Moines, Iowa. They're uniformed, they're disciplined, um, and they're working hard to make things better in this country. Did we need trails and do all that stuff? No, but did it provide jobs? Yes, it did. Much like what Hoover did with Hoover Dam. FIRA, Federal Emergency Relief Act, another alphabet soup organization. Uh, $500 million was allocated to uh, give to people who were in desperate need. Handouts, welfare payments. Guys that headed this up, his name was Harry Hopkins. Uh, again, someone like Hoover, who believed in rugged individualism and do it yourself, did, would not have approved of something like this. He would not have, have uh, been able to pull the trigger on, on, a, um, on something like this because he was so much against handouts. The CWA or Civil Works Administration, um, there, they, it was established in, in 1933 and it was designed to provide temporary jobs during the winter time. So people who were members of the CCC, the, the worry was that when winter hit, all those people would be laid off by the government and then they wouldn't have a job. So you might go to work for the CWA where you're shoveling snow somewhere, uh, something like that. So you're, you're, you're able to go to work. The WPA delved into many different areas, $11 billion on thousands of public buildings, bridges, roads, um, provided a lot of jobs. It also found part-time jobs for people who are in high school, kids who are in high school, college students, actors, musicians, and writers. They would pay a symphony to go perform. They would pay actors to go perform. The government would do this. Um, paint people who are painters, the government would buy their paintings. And it was just got delved into all areas. John Steinbeck, famous writer from Salinas, his job in Salinas was to go around and count the number of dogs in Salinas. <laughs> so some of these jobs, he said, well, did they really need to count dogs in Salinas? Nope, but did they wanna get John Steinbeck money? So, he, but did they wanna just hand it to him and have him not do anything? No, they said, hey, go count dogs in Salinas and you're gonna get paid for that. So here it says the WPA an exhibition, uh, like they're gonna take all the artwork that they had accumulated from uh, the Great Depression through the WPA and put it on display. That's, that was uh, not too long ago. 
the NRA, the National Recovery Administration, the National Recovery Act was passed to help people who were working in factories. And it was there to, to uh, allow them to join labor unions because we know that in the 1920s, labor union membership went down. Um, so it allowed people again, once again, to join labor unions. And it says it's not an illegal conspiracy. They had to do this all over again because of the 20s and what happened with big biz the rise of big business and the demise of labor unions. So they're going to get a little bit more of a recovery. Uh, but here's where the National Recovery Act started to uh, do some things that were not appreciated or, or desired by um, the Supreme Court. They started to try to control the amount of, of inventory out there. They were paying, the United States government paid factories to not produce. They said, we want you to cut your, your production of products. And they, they would give them a certain percentage that they had to cut. Now, uh, the factories were worried because they weren't producing as much, but the government said, we will pay you not to produce. If we find out that you're overproducing against our regulations, then you're not going to get this money and you're going to get fined. That's when the Supreme Court, the red lights went off and they said, we, we can't allow that in a, in a free market capitalist economy, no matter what supply and demand must be the determiner of what it, what the supply is going to, what the amount that they're going to produce is going to be. But this National Recovery Act was so popular in places like Philadelphia, which was a big industrial uh, city, that it, 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 you know, people were excited because they were able to join labor unions and their pay was going up and the amount that factories were making were going up. Didn't matter. The Supreme Court deemed it unconstitutional. But in Philadelphia, they, they liked it so much that they adopted the insignia of the NRA to the brand new NFL football team that was started during the 1930s in Philadelphia. They are called the Philadelphia Eagles, we know that, but they got their name from the insignia, or the uh, mascot of the NRA, which was the Eagle. The Eagle, the original Eagles wing looked exactly like this wing, kind of a little bit different than the uh, current Eagles helmet. All right, the 21st Amendment was passed that, that uh, repealed the 18th Amendment. There was a lot of talk going on and Roosevelt was in favor of it, of repealing prohibition, allowing people to drink again. I mean, heck, people were drinking anyway. So they said, we might as well make it legal. We might as well open up bars. Maybe that will stimulate the economy. And heck, while they're at it, they decided to ta tax alcohol and the government would get that money. So they felt it was a win-win because one, they're stimulating the economy through the opening up of businesses again, like bars, and two, they're going to tax the whiskey. So the 21st Amendment was passed. And here's a crowd in uh, Wisconsin, Madison, college town, people very excited because uh, the barrels started rolling again, meaning that they were going to start producing beer. Okay, another one of the alphabet soup organizations that uh, was very important, although it also will be deemed unconstitutional, is the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. The Agricultural Adjustment Act paid farmers not to produce. Right? They told farmers, look, we're going to fight the big O overproduction by paying you to take 20% of your land out of production. So they had them take 20% of their land out of production, and then they paid them like they farmed that land. And once again, the government told farmers, if we find out that you're planting illegally, then we're going to fine you and you're not going to get this money. So farmers were smart about it. Production was cut. Farm, uh, farmers' profits went up by like 125%. However, the Supreme Court didn't care. That green light that Roosevelt got in the beginning is going to turn yellow and then eventually red, and he's going to get super frustrated by that. The Agricultural Adjustment Act was overturned and, you know, and it, in 1936. And so what Roosevelt did is he went back to the drawing board and he created the Agricultural Adjustment Act II. And they, it's also known as the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act. And in this one, 
he tweaked the Agricultural Adjustment Act one. He tweaked it by saying, okay, we're gonna we're trying to save the soil because of the dust bowl, so much of the soil was blowing away. So he said, we are going to plant trees all around the the um, all around the um, crops as a windbreak. And we're also going to pay farmers to produce, to, to plant like soybeans and ground cover that would anchor the soil. You weren't going to eat those soybeans because that's not, they're not the type that you would eat and you're not going to eat the ground cover. What it's going to do is exactly the same thing. They planted soybeans or ground cover on 20% of their land and they produce crops on the other 80%. So Agricultural Adjustment Act 2 did almost exactly what Agricultural Adjustment Act 1 did. It cut the amount of, of uh, overproduction, it cut overproduction, and the price continued to go up. So he, he's very creative, Roosevelt was, of how he went, got around the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court let it go. Now, why was it so important to anchor the soil? Well, the Dust Bowl hit in 19... 33. I mean, imagine that you've got a great depression going on and then the dust bowl also hits. So just, you know, a lot of things going on. It's kind of like the, the uh, coronavirus and the murder hornets thing going on, right? It's like one bad thing and then another bad thing. So the dust bowl 1933 really hit the Midwest hard places like Missouri, Texas, Kansas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and all these farmers a lot of them lost their land because they couldn't plan on it anymore. Now, what happened with the Dust Bowl? There were a couple years of drought. And because they did not go down in, in wells because they couldn't afford to hire people to, to uh, dig wells, they used dry farming techniques. And as I told you, when we talked about dry farming techniques, eventually this will come back to hurt them because the, the, the uh, roots never go deep into the soil. And therefore, when the winds came, it blew all the soil away. This is a windstorm right here. Looks like the, you know, the end of times or something. That's, that's all dirt because of dry farming techniques. Now, what's the difference now is there's a huge reservoir of water under the Midwest that they're able to tap. And even if there's dry seasons, a couple dry seasons in a row, they're able to still water and deep soak that area so the roots get deeper and you don't get the Dust Bowl happening anymore. So just some pictures from the Dust Bowl. Here's the affected areas where the Dust Bowl hit. It hit hard in the black areas there. Here's a picture right here, Salinas or bust. Um, I say Salinas because many of the people from Oklahoma and Arkansas, known as Okies and Arkies, moved to Salinas and started farming here and moved to the east side of Salinas and became basically farm workers. And then when World War II hit, the Okies and the Arkies went to uh, fight overseas and Hispanics came up from Mexico and other Latin American countries through what's called the Bracero program. And then they started doing the farming. But Salinas was a common uh, destination for people from Oklahoma and Arkansas and Kansas and Nebraska, they came here searching for a better life because they lost their farms because of the Dust Bowl. The Indian Reorganization Act, also a bill signed by Roosevelt. And basically it gave Native Americans back um, a lot of their rights that were taken away from them. In 1887, we know that the Dawes Severality Act was passed that, that uh, said that Native Americans had to stay on reservations and they would get 120 acres of land as long as they were good little Americans, right? That they dressed like Americans and acted like Americans and didn't do these sacred Indian dances and whatnot. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs would report back if they were doing that. Well, the Indian Reorganization Act, Act encouraged tribes to preserve their culture and traditions now, bring those back and, and uh, you know, corrected a lot of the wrongs from the Dawes Act, allowed them to open casinos so they could make money. The SEC, another alphabet soup organization designed as a watchdog uh, to watch over the stock market, to make sure that the stock market was more of a, 
more as a trading area business rather than casinos where people were gambling and they were going and getting loans on margin loans. So the SEC still around today, their job was to prevent another crash and to monitor the stock market so it wouldn't get like it was. Definitely a reform, definitely a reform. Things like the CCC, um, you know, WPA, CWA, they're all job creators. So they're re, uh, recovery. Reform or SEC is reform. The Tennessee Valley Authority is probably all of the above. It's probably relief, recovery, and reform. Again, this TVA is still around today. Um, what TVA wanted to do was they wanted to provide jobs for people, and building dams is hard work, and and uh, you know it created a lot of jam, a lot of jobs through the building of dams. Uh, uh, dams are very valuable because they provide electricity. And what there was a study that was done and uh, Roosevelt's administration said, it's, it's really a shame that electricity is so expensive for people who live in the poor areas, like right along the Appalachian mountains in Tennessee and North Carolina and Virginia at the base of the a Appalachian mountains there. Um, they call it the area Appalachia. It's super, super poor. It still is today. But most of those people didn't have electricity because it was too expensive to, uh, to provide that for them. So the government said, we're gonna provide electricity to Appalachia 